here with Juan Carlos Bravo, and uh, he is Wildland Network Program Director for the Mexican Program. Um, known Juan Carlos for five, six, seven, eight years, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, just to just to start out, Biophilia Foundation's had a long history uh, working with Wildlands Network, and actually you were one of the funders of the um, Jaguar Preserve mm -hmm. that was created. Gosh, I don't know. Years ago, mm -hmm. maybe longer. Um, and uh, also now working with you and um, other partners on trying to uh, understand corridors and the private landowners that would uh, and do uh, make up those Jaguar corridors. I just wanted to ask you about um, your work and uh, that work in particular that I believe the foundation is. Uh, Yes, well, Wildlands Network opened our Mexico program uh, four years ago, and we started out looking at what were the opportunities for collaboration with the partners that already worked in the region. Uh, one of the immediate niches that we found was road ecology, and we started working on addressing the habitat fragmentation caused by Highway 2. Uh, we also quickly joined the, the coalition to try to stop the border wall from being built. And as we started looking at corridors and wildlife movement, it became evident that, um, that there was a need for more landowners, more ranchers to get engaged in, in protecting the places that, that jaguars and other wildlife need to move from, from one place to another. And uh, there, there are already partners in the region that are working in preserving key pieces of land for the, for the recovery of jaguars in their northernmost range in Sonora. The northernmost breeding population lives in central Sonora in, in an area known as Aguaripa. And uh, from there, it's uh, presumed that some wandering individuals uh, are the ones that have made it uh, as far north as uh, southern Arizona. And uh, it, it was in everybody's mind the question of how to get out there. And so there have been scientists who have been creating habitat models that try to answer that question. And those habitat models, of course, are a good starting point to try and look into the landscape and see, uh, do we find jaguars where the models tell us that they might be? And, and now we've reached the point where there are enough groups looking at this issue that we can create a collaborative effort into uh, both researching where jaguars might be and protecting those places. Um, the, well, Wildlands Network's role in this coalition is, uh, is a role of, of facilitation. We, are, we do not have any particular land conservation project. We are not in the, uh, doing the, the direct work of monitoring jaguar populations or somehow enhancing their viability. But what we do is we help uh, numerous partners uh, come together and share information and improve on their protocols for doing this or their protocols for doing that so that we end up, at the end of the day, with a regional vision of where jaguars are, what jaguars need, where they're going to move about, and what parcels along these corridors are key uh, for the protection, not only of the species, but of their uh, patterns of movement that have been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And so, um, by convening um, all these groups together and creating the cartography that's fed with the information they have that, that we collect and, and that we curate, uh, we are helping uh, create this, this joint vision of Jaguar recovery and, and Jaguar corridor conservation between Sonora and Arizona. And, and Jaguars historically uh, ranged in the United States mm -hmm. from uh, the Gulf of Mexico all the way to, um, I guess, bordered by the Gogion Rim, I would think. Yeah, more or less. Uh, it depends on how far back in history you want to go back. There are fossil records of them as far north as the state of Washington oh, really? and North Carolina. Oh, yeah, and so, really? but, but those are fossil records uh, of an animal that, that was definitely a jaguar. Uh, but wow. then if, uh, if you go more into you know, um, uh, the, the ancient traditions of Native Americans, you, you start uh, sensing that there's a gap there. That, that they're not talking about jaguars. There, there's no oral tradition of jaguars uh, or anything okay. like there, like there used to be. Well, like there still is for uh, the native tribes of, of Mexico. 
And, uh, but then there is a constant culture of jaguars in the southwest, in certain places in the southwest, as far north as the Grand Canyon, uh, where there were certainly uh, records of jaguars. And then uh, when the colonists came in, most of these records were eventually reported as um, uh, either bounty hunts or uh, pelts, or it, it was always related to the eradication of the species from, from the US southwest. Mm. And that's how we know how, how they were killed and exterminated in, in the US southwest. And the pattern uh, changed significantly in the 90s after almost more than a decade without a single record of, of jaguars in, in the US, when a couple of uh, cougar hunters in Arizona in, in a period of uh, eight months suddenly came across live jaguars in their, in their attempt to hunt what they thought was a cougar. And in both of these cases, these hunters uh, put down their rifles and pulled out their cameras and took pictures of these animals and walked away and left them alone because they were in awe of this magnificent animal. And that triggered a huge interest in Arizona, in particular in the whole of the US, in what are these animals doing here in the US? Aren't they a tropical species? And well, that allowed uh, funding to be channeled to research that answered the question, no, I mean, they go as far north as uh, north, Northwest Mexico, there's a, there's a healthy breeding population of jaguars 150 miles south of the US-Mexico border, and 150 miles for jaguars is uh, a relatively doable distance you know, when they have to move about and disperse as, as younger animals need to find new grounds. Uh, they're definitely making it into the US, and they continue to make it to the US. Yeah, and um, how would you, Characterize sort of uh, the border as a barrier, and um, what's the, what's the science say about that? And it's definitely going to be a, a, a border for wildlife. It's going to be uh, an obstacle for wildlife. The only animal capable of crossing any border design or border wall design that you can come up with are humans. Humans are always going to be creative enough to to build a taller ladder or. Uh, deeper tunnel mm -hmm. or some other way to get across. There's just no way of, of keeping humans away from uh, from a place where they want to be. Uh, not when you have a 3,000 mile line that, that, that you want to, uh, to keep them away from. So other than that, animals are gonna find an obstacle. And depending on the design, what animals you leave out. But the more modern designs are what we call less permeable to wildlife, which means nothing gets through. And, uh, and then that means that you have a huge obstacle for wildlife that's doing absolutely nothing to, to stop illegal migration to the United States. Yeah. Um, it's a little depressing. I love jaguars. I think they're you know, beautiful animals, but in many ways they um, are very charismatic, um, but they also represent the needs of many other species. Of course. In terms of, uh, of course. habitat and uh, corridor, uh, the ability to, to migrate. Yeah. To migrate. They're what, what is known as an umbrella species. If you get to protect jaguars, then you're protecting the habitat, the prey species, a bunch of other things that jaguars need. And in doing so, you are providing for a much, much larger suite of species that depend on the landscape and the attributes of the other species that jaguars depend on. Mm -hmm. And so they, they're a, a good species to protect in and of themselves. I mean, they, they, say, they certainly have an inherent value like every other species. They are a very attractive species, culturally very significant in, in Mexico. And, and, they, um, and they also provide all of this uh, um, umbrella effect for, for much smaller wildlife that might not be as sexy, to be honest. If, if you approach a, a foundation maybe with, uh, hey, we want to protect this tarantula or this mosquito, uh, they might not be interested. They might find it a little hard to understand the ecological role of that species. But, but a jaguar is, is pretty straightforward. They're beautiful, they're big, they're bold. They, they are uh, monarchs of their territories uh, and they have a very clear connection to the landscape through predation, uh, uh, and and its trickle effect on everything, vegetation, songbirds, etc. That all uh, depends on on what jaguars are doing to the landscape. Plus, uh, you are talking about a relatively manageable number of animals. You know, uh, uh, population.
population of the jaguars are in the hundreds or thousands of animals, you know, not in the millions of animals. And so uh, that's something you can, you can start thinking about monitoring and figuring out how well they're doing. And, and even uh, 50 animals are going to make a huge change in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're certainly a keystone species, uh, very important mm -hmm. uh, for, for a multiple of reasons. I'm curious, um, have you witnessed um, changing attitudes in, in terms of land, uh, Mexican landowners mm -hmm. um, and, and their uh, relationship with the jaguar? How, how would you characterize that? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of Wildlands Network's partners is the group uh, called Northern Jaguar Project. The Northern Jaguar Project protects uh, what's known as the Northern Jaguar Reserve, uh, a series of, of properties in this core area for the northernmost breeding population of jaguars. And uh, besides protecting these ranches through owning them and managing them, they, they do a lot of work with the ranchers around them. Uh, work that involves uh, setting up camera traps and, uh, and providing financial incentives to these ranchers whenever uh, a jaguar shows up in one of these camera traps or a cougar or a bobcat. And this is a program that I actually got to start when, before I worked in Wildlands. And, and I, I jump-started a program and it's been running ever since for, uh, for over 10 years now. And one of the, the things that was most gratifying about that project is that one of the ranchers in the region that was most against jaguars suddenly tr came around and now he, he approached uh, the, the coordinators of the program and asked them, uh, I want to be a part of this program. I, wanna, I want you guys to start putting up camera traps in my, in my property. And uh, this comes along with the responsibility that you have to allow researchers to, to go in and monitor that you're not hunting, you're not poisoning, you're not trapping, those kinds of things. Uh, unannounced, they can come anytime to, um, to check on, on compliance. And so he gladly accepted and now he's, he's been involved with the project for several years and there's jaguars showing up in his property and he's not killing them. Uh, so we're seeing that. Uh, and another thing we're seeing is that there is, there, we're starting to see a generational change in management. Mm. Uh, and some of the younger generations of ranchers and by younger, I mean in their 60s or 50s, are, um, <laughs> are not as uh, hostile to, to carnivores as, as the people they are replacing. You know, uh, uh, their, their parents usually, or uncles or, or grandparents in some cases, that grew up in a very different ranching culture uh, that had no, um, that gave no value to biodiversity. So we're, we're starting to see a little bit of that. And hopefully uh, it's, it's a trend that will make more, more safe havens here. A, a, very, a very good balance uh, where economy and ecology are tied. Because they are. Uh, in the end they are. But, um, but by forgetting they are, we're stressing the ecology side of it at the expense of trying to grow the economy part of it until it collapses, until everything collapses. Right. But we're, we're hoping we won't reach that. We're hoping we can reach a balance where we're both thrive together. And uh, I think that, that having uh, uh, regional partners start looking into this and, and learning about carbon sequestration as it relates to the restoration work is going to allow, um, uh, it's going to allow them to be in the front line of, uh, of making the best of these markets when those markets are there. Uh, that's an excellent uh, description of what we call a restoration economy, the creation of an economy that is restorative instead of just purely extractive, mm -hmm. um, which is much of the history of southern Arizona and northern North Sonora. Mexico. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What, what are your experiences with the interests of landowners toward restoration? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been, I think, a little bit of a stretch, which is a, Remarkable, but for whatever reasons, it's a little bit of a stretch to get people to understand that um, holding back water and restoring riparian areas, in particular, um, is, is so valuable in, in an arid landscape. Especially one, and I, I guess I really what my question is, you know, you know, why why is it so important here? You know, obviously it, as an arid landscape, but also the weird one's called the Sky Islands yeah. region, and the Sky Islands region. And, uh, Love to have you explain this because you'll do a better job than I will. Um, is one of the uh, most biologically diverse areas of the world because of its connection.
connection between the Rocky Mountains and north and the Sierra Madre to the south and other uh, uh, large areas of um, undis relatively undisturbed mm -hmm. uh, uh, core wildlife areas. Yeah, certainly the Sky Islands region is, is uh, of, of, of global significance. It is a, a region where these isolated mountain ranges create an, arch an inland archipelago where uh, you can find some of the same drivers of evolution and diversification of species as you would find in, in a, an ocean uh, archipelago. And so that has created a very unique diver diversity along with the, its position in, uh, in, the, in between uh, the tropical areas and the colder, what are called Neo-Arctic uh, regions. And so you've got all this influence of tropical uh, uh, climates that, that leave you with jaguars and macaws and, and all kinds of tropical species in a place where you also have uh, bald eagle and black bear and species uh, more akin to, to colder climates. And that's just an example of how this diversity is built. Uh, you also happen to have the Chihuahuan Desert and the Sonoran Desert meeting right there in the Sky Islands. And those are two of the most diverse uh, deserts in, in the whole world and, and so you get all that in this region and and it becomes evident that you're going to have a lot of biodiversity and then people moved into this area uh, many many thousands of years ago and, and have been around for a lot of time uh, here and have been uh, cultivating the, the area and have been hunting in the area and then there was a huge wave of colonization by, by white settlers both in Mexico and, and the US and, and that definitely had an, an impact on the landscape and with them came ranching and mining operations that were certainly more uh, uh, aggressive on the landscape than, than the kind of use that, that, that people would give the landscape in the past. And, um, and so you start seeing that stress over 500 years ago on the landscape. And that stress has been reflected in, uh, in less water in the landscape, to put it simply. Um, and another important factor was the industrial scale of hunting in, in the area. Uh, beavers were very abundant in this region and they were hunted for their pelts. Uh, the, the whole beaver industry jump-started Wall Street and then you've got all this huge economy that depended on, on pelts from all over the, the, the continent, but that decimated these populations. And now beavers who were capturing lots of water throughout the landscape are now gone. And, and you've got uh, rivers that are running a lot faster. The, the water is just leaving, with, uh, leaving behind a lot of erosion. And, uh, and, and people are, are, are faced with a landscape that's not what their grandparents did. Yes. Uh, beaver are making their way back into this region. Uh, there are other restoration projects that are, that are creating ways for, for water to, to be maintained on the ground. And of course, beavers were not in every single creek, not everything is, is beaver habitat. But using the same principle of slowing down water so that it will permeate and allow for plants to use it more, you're, you're creating these sponges here and there. This is necessary for people who depend on the landscape, like ranchers. You, you've got more water and more feed for their cows. Um, it is important for wildlife. And it's gonna be more and more important because of climate change, because uh, it, it definitely threatens with uh, this region with becoming more uh, arid uh, as, as time goes by. Uh, so if we don't start doing something to, to slow down water and keep it where we need it, um, it's just going to get worse. Yeah, really, with, along with uh, creating habitat and, and making it uh, more viable for wildlife to survive, uh, we're adding resilience into the system, which is exactly what's needed with uh, the effects of climate change that, that we're beginning to see. Um, well, I want to thank you, Juan Carlos, for taking the time to talk <laughs> to us today. Um, thank you. For <laughs> and thanks everyone who's listening to this. I hope you, you got to learn a little bit about the Sky Islands of Mexico and the United States. It's a, it's a shared landscape that I love and, I, and that many of us are fighting every day to keep protected from all the different threats that we have, whether it's a border wall or mining or roads. Uh, it, it's going to take a lot of community effort to do it. 
and we were very pleased to be uh, getting the support of Biophilia in, in bringing more and more people together to protect jaguars with corridors and the water that they need. Appreciate that. Thank you for your hard work. <laughs> no problems. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>